Hi, welcome to Old World Order Theology with Brian Newberry, and today is part two of two, a series on the LGBT movement. Today, we are going to be discussing the historical roots and the essential nature and progress of the LGBT and or gay rights political movement. Uh, please, if you have not uh, seen my part one video on this topic, uh, part one dealt with the theology and the, the biblical analysis of you know people who call themselves Christians who support the LGBT movement. This one has to do with the historical um, and sociological foundation and the progress this movement has made uh, in recent decades. And again, like I said in the last video, this is not intended to be insulting or uh, you know, to condemn anybody on a personal level. I'm trying to be as objective as possible and reveal uh, the truth of the matter. So with that being said, let us proceed. So in order to understand the essence of a thing, it is important to understand its origins and early development. In this case, we are examining the origins and early development of the modern gay rights and LGBT movement. Herein, I will briefly highlight some of the historical, philosophical, and even theological constructs pushing the movement forward. Then I will make the connections of not only the current social phenomena, but also the internal scandals in the Catholic Church and in Christian churches abroad. So let's go back to the Russian Revolution of 1917. It was inspired by a Mar Marxist philosophy, and there's good evidence that uh, Lenin and Stalin were Freemasons as well. And it resulted in the emergence of the Communist Soviet Union. Consequently, Russia had a sexual re revolution during the 1920s, including the propagation of homosexuality and gay rights on equal footing with the traditional family even though Joseph Stalin was sensible enough to pull back on gay rights during the 1930s because it was destroying families and the economy. In order for Marxism to be effective, where the government becomes daddy and mommy, the traditional nuclear family must be weakened or dismantled. A demand must justify the supply. Redefining the family, marriage, and humanity itself will naturally provide such a demand. This can easily take place under the guise of equality, and human or civil rights. In parallel fashion, the United States endured the Red Scare, you know, the Russian Scare, the communist invasion, and McCarthyism during the 1950s, with many communists allegedly infiltrating American institutions and government positions. Consequently, America had a sexual revolution of its own during the 1960s, including the propagation of homosexuality and gay rights. The opportunity for this arose in the context of the Vietnam War, the mass importation of drugs, and fueled by the countercultural hippie movement of rock and roll music. So who are some of the major players, their philosophy, and their ideas about the family? Earlier in the 20th century, a prominent Freemason, a British spy, a occultist, and a man who called himself the Beast of Revelation named Aleister Crowley, wrote and propagated many of his New Age occult ideas th throughout the Western world. His ideas heavily influenced the countercultural hippie movement and sexual revolution in America and abroad during the 1960s. Aside from his occult organization of the or Ordo Templi Orientis, or the OTO, he influenced the Church of Satan founded by Anton LaVey. He also influenced Scientology, which is founded by L. Ron Hubbard. He influence sexologist Alfred Kinsley, who was a major propagator of the gay rights movement, and he also heavily influenced rock bands such as the Beatles, the Doors, the Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, and many others. In fact, Aleister Crowley's photos appeared on the cover of the Beatles album Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club. He's in the top row, the second on the left, with the, the bald head. Aleister Crowley's mantra, which was, do it thy wilt, under love, meaning self-love, this is the whole of the law, this mantra was adopted by the Church of Satan. The hippie phrase, if it feels good, do it, is a modification of Crowley's rule. Let us take a look at a couple of Aleister Crowley's quotes on the subject at hand. 
the first of which he declared that the family is public enemy number one. And this quote is from his book, Magic Without Tears, uh, published by New Falcon Publishers, 8th printing edition, April 1st, 1991. Quote, wherever the family has been strong, it has always been the engine of tyranny. Curse them. They are always in the way. To the performance of this work of the new age, the nearest obstacle and the most obvious is the family. Close quote. Uh, on the topic of sodomy or homosexuality and pedophilia, Crowley had this to say, and this is from his The World's Tragedy, 1985, pages 22 through 23. Quote, let me seduce the boys of England. I shall fight openly for what no living Englishman dare to defend, even in secret, sodomy. And in truth, there seems to seems no better way than to avoid the contamination of women. Sodomy is an aristocratic virtue, which our middle class had better imitate if they wish to be smart. Close quote. Aleister Crowley also had a profound influence on the man who was considered as the founder of the modern gay rights movement in the West, a man named Harry Hay. Historian and biographer Stuart Timmons revealed Hayes' Crowleyan affiliation in his biography. Quote, Harry, Harry Hay played the organ for the Los Angeles Lodge, or the OTO, Aleister Crowley's notorious anti-Christian spiritual group, a secret society known to have created homosexual sex magic rituals. And that's in his book, Stuart Timmons' book, uh, The Trouble with Harry Hay, Founder of the Modern Gay Movement. Allison Publications, 1990, page 75. As a musician, Harry Hay understood the subjective and emotional power and influence that music has over people. The counter-cultural hippie movement of the 1960s was his opportunity to propagate the ideas of his movement. It is not coincidental that today many leftist ideas are assisted by contemporary pop music and entertainment. Timmons goes on to reveal how Hay used music as the vehicle to drive forth his movement. Quote, and this is page 128 of the same book. Quote, this language of music had the power to communicate ideas, plans, and issues in the form of songs and dances under the noses of the authorities as a weapon. Music always has had the power to inspire revolt and revolution. Close quote. These two quotes also reveal the spiritual nature of homosexuality and even music. This is not a mere physical phenomenon we are dealing with. Aside from the occultic Crowleyan influence, being a member of the OTO, which is an anti-Christian spiritual group, and creating homosexual sex magic rituals in the context of a secret society are indicators that homosexuality is a spiritual vice, as scripture also alludes to. The OTO, being a secret society, is also Masonic in nature, and we'll revisit that in a little bit. In a book co-authored by Harry Hay himself, the spiritual or religious nature of his sodomy is foretold, as the text states, quote, Hay refers to gay men's sexuality as our gateway to spirit. Beginning in 1991, he has held yearly sex magic workshops to explore these potentials with other gay men, close quote. And this is in a book authored by Harry Hay and Will Roscoe called Radically Gay, Gay Liberation in the World of Its Founder. From Beacon Press Publications, 1997, pages 248 and 249. It is also well known that Hay was closely affiliated with the pedophile group NAMBLA, which stands for North American Man-Boy Love Association. And this is a, a lobbyist group which attempts to lower the age of sexual consent and seeks to legitimize pedophilia and pederasty. This was a common practice in ancient pagan cultures, such as in ancient Greece. And the common thread between sodomy and pedophilia is undeniable by the objective researcher. Nambla could be seen marching in the earliest pride parades, and Harry Hay was unapologetically supportive of the group Nambla. There is a plethora of video footage and photos which confirm these facts, including Harry Hay wearing a coat which reads, Nambla walks with me. And just in case someone makes the claim that Hay was an outlier who did not share the common views of the gay rights movement, despite being the alleged founder, here is a statement from a man named Michael Swift, who was a writer from Gay Community News, which confirms the thread. And the Gay Community News was an American weekly newspaper published in Boston, Massachusetts from 1973 to 1992 by the Bromfield Street Educational Foundation. 
designed as a resource for the LGBT community, the paper reported on a wide variety of gay and lesbian related news. So this is what Michael Swift has to say, quote, we shall sodomize your sons, emblems of your feeble masculinity. We shall seduce them in your schools, in your dormitories, in your gymnasiums, in your locker rooms, in your sports arenas, in your seminaries, in your youth groups, close quote. Now, just in case the reader here has not put two and two together, let me expound on how this is connected to the current crisis in the Catholic Church and in society at large. Most knowledgeable traditional Catholics realize that there has been a documented and verified infiltration in the Church of Freemasons and Communists, both of whom might commonly be referred to as modernists. The Alta Vendita and AA-1025, among other sources, give further details about these infiltrations, respectively, and perhaps we'll revisit those documents in a later uh, video. The plans of the modernist infiltration goes back to at least the 19th century, but their success was evident in the early to mid 20th century. Thus, the common thread of the Freemason, Aleister Crowley, and the communist sexual revolution repeating in America cannot be dismissed as coincidence. The above quote by Swift, referring to seducing boys even in seminaries, is especially relevant given the recent scandals of the deposed Theodore McCarrick and many others in the church. Even so, there have been many reports that speak of Catholic seminaries being not only openly gay-friendly, but filled with homosexual activities. Let us back up just a bit and make a parallel. What exactly happened in the 1960s with the Catholic Church and in the American culture? Is it a mere coincidence that during the sexual revolution of the 1960s, the Catholic Church also had a countercultural movement better known as the Vatican II Council? When you read the writings of Aleister Crowley and even some of the lyrics of 1960s rock bands, such as Hair, there was the promotion of the idea that they had entered a new eon, a new age, called the Age of Aquarius, also known as the Age of Horus, who is an Egyptian deity, which would usher in the New World Order. Culturally speaking, this is accurate, as Western civilization has never been the same since the 1960s, and has been in a morally downward spiral ever since. The same can be said of the Catholic Church. The Vatican II Council changed the entire religious and theological construct of how the Church interacted with the world, from that which she had during the previous 1930 years. Some even say that the Council created a new religion, and when one objectively observes the previous 20 councils and then looks at the Vatican II documents, it appears evident. Instead of fighting against the secular world powers and influencing society with our religious orders, hospitals, universities, libraries, charities, etc., now it appears as if secular society, even the United Nations, is influencing the church. Instead of proclaiming the gospel to all the nations, now most of the leaders of the church want to dialogue with other religions and even hold hands and pray together and use brilliant sophistry to say that perhaps people in false religions can be saved and go to heaven too. Even worse than that, the new ecumenism, this new springtime of evangelization, this new Pentecost and new theology is the new liturgy, which appears to be a hybrid of Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish liturgies being completely void of the so-called negative theology, i.e. sin, repentance, heaven, hell, self-denial, etc. Space does not permit me to go into great detail on these issues, but the architect of the new liturgical movement, Annabali Bonini, was alleged to be, have been a Freemason, as he had been banished by Pope John XXIII, but reinstated by Pope Paul VI. Now, what does this have to do with the topic at hand? There is the theological concept of lex orandi lex credendi, which is Latin meaning the law of praying is the law of believing. The idea is that the prayers of the liturgy reflect the beliefs, doctrines, and practices of the Catholic. Thus, to change the prayers of the liturgy would impact and potentially change the beliefs, doctrines, and practices or behavior of Catholics. Not only has that Negative thought, not only has negative theology been removed from the pulpit and from some of the readings, but the prayers which are offensive to Protestants, especially ones invoking saintly intercession, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Last Gospel, the Leonine prayers, and so on, have also largely been removed. So now we have a Novus Ordo liturgy, which is watered down, barely Catholic, 
and the music has went from sacred Gregorian chant to 70s folk music and such, the concept of bodily mortification, penance, fasting, feast days are rarer to most Novus Ordo parishes. The change in attitude, reverence, and behavior of the average Catholic is inevitable under such circumstances. So what of the clergy? Not long after the council, the religious orders and the priesthood were greatly diminished. So once upon a time when the orders would provide various charities for the poor and the needy, now they have vanished and the secular state has picked up the tab. The socialists cannot be more pleased. Now that the average Catholic family is smaller, there are fewer potential males who might enter into the priesthood. Consequently, a greater deal of men with homosexual inclinations have joined the priesthood and the seminaries and, this, and the seminaries attest to this fact, not to mention priests who now come out of the closet during a homily and then receive applause from the congregants, God forbid. So now there is a significant number of priests whom we call father whose masculinity is in doubt. With that in mind, we must consider the facts of the recent sexual scandals in the church over the last two decades. The mainstream media will virtually always refer to the scandals involving pedophile priests or the, the abuse of children. While these scandals do involve these circumstances also, about 5%, according to the John Jay report, they are not the majority. It is reported that about 81% of the victims in the Catholic Church abuse scandals are males, and 40% of the total victims are between ages of 11 and 14, with the males being generally older. This is not pedophilia proper, as pedophilia involves prepubescent children. Thus, the issue at hand is homosexual in nature, four out of five cases being such, and largely involving teen boys and even some young adults. So let us tie everything together now. The sequence of events in U.S. during the 19. 50s and 1960s remarkably parallels that of the Russian Revolution of 1917 and the decade that followed. There is documented evidence that the Freemasons and Communists desired to infiltrate the Catholic Church and were at least partially successful in the early to mid 20th century. The Freemasons and Communists both have a globally oriented agenda based on the common brotherhood and solidarity of men, i.e. secular humanism. Communism is based on the idea that the state acts as a parent, thus actual parents and a healthy nuclear family are obstacles to communism. During the 1960s, the countercultural sexual revolution in America and Western civilization in general propagated ideas put forth earlier by occultists and self-proclaimed beast of revelation Aleister Crowley, whose main principle was that man should fulfill his own will. The Church of Satan also adopted the Do What Thy Wilt mantra from Crowley. The founder of the modern gay rights movement, Harry Hay, was a disciple of Aleister Crowley and affiliated with the OTO, a secret society of anti-Christian spirituality where homosexual magic rituals were being performed, affiliated with the, and he was also affiliated with the pedophile group NAMLA and admittedly used popular music of his time to propagate his agenda. During the same time period, the Catholic Church convenes an unnecessary ecumenical council, Vatican II. This council drastically changed the approach of the Church to the world, changed the framework of her theology, changed her approach to other heretical religions, and created a new hybrid liturgy and in many cases stripped sanctuaries of their decor. The results of the council has been a drastic ground downgrade of the priesthood in quality and quantity, a drastic reduction of the religious orders, which has negatively impacted society and produced a demand for the state to create socialist programs, a, virtu a virtual elimination of negative theology being preached, which includes the need for repentance and penance, avoiding sin at all costs, and the possibility of hell for unrepentant souls. Further, homosexuality is either not Discussed, or even worse, the faithful are encouraged to be welcoming, accepting, and inclusive without exhortation for people with homosexual inclinations to live chaste lives of continual penance. Incidentally, the church is enduring the worst recorded sexual scandal of the priesthood in her 2,000-year history, scandals which primarily consist of homosexual acts. Men who believe in and fear God do not do this. Therefore, the only reasonable conclusion one can make is that Along with Pope Paul VI, the smoke of Satan has entered the temple of God and is roaming about, seeking to devour whom he may. 
Now, clerics such as James Martin, they want to build a bridge to the LGBT community. I say, burn down the bridge, and may God help us. In nomine Patris, et Filii, Spiritus Sancti. Amen.